Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. I'm Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Today's question. Dear Pastor, my question is about the expressions that Paul uses in Colossians 3 verse 5, such as mortification and dying to self. 1 Corinthians 15, I die daily. And Romans 6, counting yourself dead to sin and places like that. What exactly is meant by mortification and dying to self? Is it simply a matter of abstention from temptation, like a man with a weakness for alcohol avoiding the liquor store on his way home? Or is there more to it than that? Well, my friend, there is a whole lot more to it than that. Mortification just means to put something to death. And when we put something to death, that's good, but something else has to rise and take its place then. And when we talk about mortification, we can mean it in three different ways. So the first is contrition, that is sorrow over sin. The second is suffering and bearing our crosses with patience. And the third then is actively doing what's necessary to restrain our own sinful flesh's desires and passions. In each one of these three ways of understanding mortification, mortification can never be alone by itself. It has to be coupled with, followed by faith, which quickens, enlivens, and brings renewal. So let's look at the first kind of contrition, that is sorrow, or the first kind of uh, mortification, excuse me, contrition, uh, which is sorrow over our sins. So we confess in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. This is um, Article 12, 46 and 47. Paul almost everywhere when he describes conversion or renewal designates these two parts, mortification and quickening, as in Colossians 2, 11, in whom, ye, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, namely by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. And afterwards, Colossians 2.12, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Here are two parts. One is the putting off of the body of sins, and the other is the rising again through faith. Neither ought uh, these words, mortification, quickening, putting off of the body of sins, rising again, be understood in a platonic way concerning a, a feigned change. But mortification signifies true terrors, such as those of the dying, which nature could not sustain unless it were supported by faith. So he names that as the putting off of the body of sins, which we ordinarily call contrition. Because in these griefs, the natural concupiscence is purged away. And the quickening ought not to be understood as a platonic fancy, but as a consolation which truly sustains life that is escaping in contrition. Here, therefore, are two parts contrition and faith. For as conscience cannot be pacified except by faith, therefore faith alone quickens, according to the declaration, Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Contrition over sins. It, it mortifies our flesh because it puts off sins. You know, contrition is when we feel sorry for our sins, when we acknowledge them to be sins, and then we uh, we acknowledge that they offend God and that we, we deserve his merit, or we, we merit and deserve his eternal wrath and punishment for our sins. Melanchthon describes these as true terrors and griefs, which then purge away the natural concupiscence, the, the natural sinful desire. This means that if we're truly contrite for, over our sins, we're going to be ashamed of them and we're going to be disgusted by them so that we, we don't want to do them anymore. So that's how we die to ourselves and, and die to our sinful passions and desires. That's the first mortification. The second way we use mortification then is to signify uh, the putting to death of our flesh that occurs when we bear crosses, trials, and afflictions in patience and trust in God. Now, this is an involuntary mortification, uh, just like the first one is, uh, because it's God who lays the afflictions and crosses upon us. We confess. And of the mortification of the flesh and discipline of the body, we teach thus. Just as the confession states that a true and not a feigned mortification occurs through the cross and afflictions, by which God exercises us, when God breaks our will, inflicts the cross and trouble. In these we must obey God's will. As Paul says in Romans 12, 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And these are the spiritual exercises of fear and faith. 
What he's saying here is that God sends crosses, afflictions, troubles, trials upon us in order to exercise our faith. If it's sickness or disease, the death of a loved one, or, or any other trial that he sends upon us, then uh, he wants us to use them, use that trial to draw us to himself in faith and prayer, or that he wants to use them to draw us to himself. Luther once said, God both loves and hates our afflictions. He loves them when they draw us to him, when they provoke us to prayer. He hates them when, they, when we are driven to despair by them. Afflictions and crosses, then, they put to death the sinful flesh uh, when Christians bear them patiently, when we accept them as fatherly discipline, and when we consider passages like Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, just as a father uh, the son in whom he delights. So, Faith accepts that our crosses and afflictions are allowed, are placed on us by God, and that he wants us to bear them patiently uh, and in trust in him. And that faith then puts to death the flesh's complaining, the flesh's self-idolatry that thinks that it knows best, not God. And so then we can accept our afflictions and crosses as God's will for us, for his glory, and for our eternal good. In afflictions we trust with David in Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And we know that that is true, if not in this life, then certainly in the life of the world to come. Now that leaves the third, and probably the most common way of speaking about mortification of the flesh. And this is uh, the voluntary disciplining of the flesh for the purpose of restraining it. Uh, to mortify the flesh in this sense means that we are actively working to restrain the flesh, uh, to tell it no, and, and to, to train it not to sin, uh, so that we, the flesh doesn't grow in us, the old man doesn't grow and lead us into carnal security or indifference about the things of God and his commandments. So we confess in the Apology, uh, Article 14, paragraphs 45 through 48, but in addition to this mortification, which occurs through the cross, which we just mentioned, there is also a voluntary kind of exercise necessary, of which Christ says in Luke 21, 34, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep under my body and bring it, in, bring it into subjection, etc. And these exercises are to be undertaken not because they are services that justify but in order to curb the flesh, lest satiety may overpower us and render us secure and indifferent, the result of which is that men indulge and obey the dispositions of the flesh. This diligence ought to be perpetual because it has the perpetual command of God. Examples of this voluntary mortification of the flesh, mortifications that you would choose to do, uh, would be fasting from food and drink. Uh, abstinence from certain pleasures, uh, an increase then in the reading of scriptures, um, manual labor even, uh, basically any sort of discipline by which you're telling the flesh no and reining it in. When we talk about mortification in this sense, uh, in the sense of disciplining our bodies and our minds, it means more than simply then abstaining from certain things. You know, a, a man can avoid drinking uh, if he's had problems with alcoholism, but he can still be a dry drunk. He can still be remaining in those same uh, emotional uh, thought and, and behavioral patterns. And so abstaining from temptations and sins is necessary. But when we crucify, Christ, uh, when we crucify the flesh's passions and desires, then we have to also be raised as the new man in Christ. So we present our bodies as living sacrifices by putting to death our flesh. But we must also then be renewed in the spirit of our mind so that we walk in the spirit. Uh, so that we set our minds on what is true, what is noble, what is just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, praiseworthy, the things that Paul speaks of in Philippians 4, 8. We restrain the flesh so that we can, so that we can live as the new man who runs the way of God's commandments, Psalm 119, 32. Uh, the man who delights in the law of the Lord, Romans 7, 22. If we just discipline our bodies and our minds to abstain from sin, without replacing our thoughts with the mind of Christ, 
and then our words and our deeds and our love for God and our neighbor, uh, they're, they're not going to go anywhere. Uh, we, we've just made ourselves into Pharisees who excel at cleaning the outside of the dish while the inward part is still full of greed and wickedness and idolatry uh, and the like. So there has to be the putting away of sin, the daily uh, mortifying of the flesh, but also then the daily rising to walk and live uh, in the Holy Spirit which is given to us through holy baptism. So mortification has to be accompanied, in all instances, by faith. Uh, contrition has to be followed by confident faith, which raises us to new life. Cross and afflictions from God have to be borne in faith, patient trust and prayer, so that they benefit us. And voluntary discipline has to be accompanied by that renewal of the mind, uh, because their entire purpose is to make us better suited for contemplating the gospel and for living in love for our neighbors. Uh, in these ways, then, the sinful flesh is mortified, put to death, so that each day we may arise as new creatures to live in purity and righteousness.